Okay, good morning. Welcome to VSPG. Today we're hearing from Felix Gervais, looking at mesoproterozoic tectonics from a Grenvillian perspective. <clears throat> Andre is going to go ahead and introduce Felix for us. So Andre, please go ahead. Yeah, it's a pleasure to introduce Felix. Uh, Felix uh, is uh, originally from Quebec and did his uh, undergraduate at EUCAM and uh, a master degree in Quebec City and followed with PhD in Carleton. And he developed interest in metamorphic uh, petrology, tectonics, and mostly focused on Greenville orogeny. And so he will give us a perspective and it seems like it more controversial perspective, but let's take a look. Uh, Felix. Okay, so thanks, uh, Andre and Alex, for giving me this uh, opportunity to present in this great conference format. So um, today's talk is published in Heart and Planetary Science Letter last year, um, and basically, it's to I wanted to bring to bring some data on the table on the table, uh, presenting some Grenvillian perspective on the debate about mesoproterozoic tectonics. Because you may be aware of all the debates going on about uh, what type of tectonics was going on in the Mesoproterozoic. Uh, here are some, some papers that have been published, published in the last 10 years or so. Um, and most of these studies were based on proxies, proxies of past tectonic activities. So uh, some of these are geological, like what we see on the on the right of elite blue schist, lacinite, ultra high pressure metamorphic rocks, which basically don't start until we're around 900 MA. And it's been suggested that this was the start of plate tectonics or even younger than that. Um, but a lot of the debate has centered on what has been called this, the Boring Billion. So the Boring Billion is a period between 1.8 to 0.8 GA. Uh, and it's shown on the, on the gray bar here on these diagrams. Now, <clears throat> I'm fully aware that uh, there are updated curves for these proxies, but uh, I think the main result is basically the same uh, and the curves that are shown here are perhaps more complex um, but they show the same trend so on the top left you have the amount of passive margin the number of passive margin in the geological record now it's been suggested that if you have passive margins it means that somewhere else you have subduction zone so it's a proxy of tectonic activities and you see that there is a paucity of passive margins number in the boring billion. At the bottom here, you have histograms in orange uh, that shows the, the abundance of detrital zircon in the global database. Uh, you can see again, there's a low in the period uh, between throughout most of the Proterozoic, even though there is a, a spike during the Grenvillian erogeny. And then in the middle, this important curve showed the Epsilon HF in, in, the, the, in the global detrital zircon database uh, shown below. And what you can see is that during this period, um, the zircon have a, a, a juvenile signature, suggesting that juvenile igneous rocks were formed and this, the blue curve here is the normalized uh, strontium isotope curve, which is thought to reflect the shedding of non-radiogenic material, often from juvenile igneous rocks, into the ocean that is taking up in limestone and uh, frozen there so that we can measure the isotopic uh, of their formation, the isotope ratio of their formation. So again, this is, this is coherent with uh, arcs, if you were in the plate tectonic style, uh, this would be coherent with arcs shedding non-radiogenic material in the ocean, taking up in limestone, and that non-radiogenic phase would not be counterbalanced by radiogenic 
material eroded from consonants during consonantal collision. Uh, there's another two other proxies, uh, sorry, are the uh, the Europium anomaly in zircon that you see here showing that uh, there's a trend there of decreasing uh, Europium anomaly and Tang et al. have related this to uh, the thickness of the crust, the thickness at which the zircon were formed. But this has been uh, heavily uh, contested by a recent paper by Yakim Chuck et al. But still, a lot of people have, have discussed this curve. And then you also have the, the metamorphic gradient recorded in thermobarometric studies showing that uh, relatively high uh, ratio of temperature and pressure divided by pressure for, for that period, higher than every 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 at any time in Earth history. So again, all of this, if you're in a plate tectonic setting, consistent with the formation of arcs and not many collision zones involving continent. So some view this, uh, like Tang, view this as a period of tectonic quiescence and others like uh, Bob Stern goes even further to suggest that it was a, a period where there was no plate tectonics at all. He suggested a period of, of, of single lid tectonics and uh, suggesting there was a lot of plume, mental convection, movement perhaps of, of, of blocks but without subduction and that these movement of blocks could have produced some deformation that we see in the Granville type origin. But then these are all proxies of tectonic activities but we know there was a lot of tectonic activities, uh, the Grenvillian even. So some went as far as suggesting that this period marks the, the originic climax on Earth. And just from hard geological data, we know it was a big mountain belt because we have remnant of that continuously from uh, southwestern US to northeastern Canada and then if you close the Atlantic Ocean, it continues in, uh, in southern uh, Scandinavia. So it was a, and probably that other craton were juxtaposed to that. So it's a huge mountain belt. And uh, we find evidence of uh, Grenvillian age basin uh, throughout Laurentia, in, even in westernmost Laurentia, in northwesternmost Laurentia, indicating that there was a major fluviatal system transporting sediments from this highly elevated mountain belt across the entire continent to shed uh, sediments and basins. So this, this must have required a, a significant elevation. So what about hard geological data? We talk a lot about proxies in the literature, but not much about uh, geological data from the main, per the main period. So I think it's, it's useful to, at this point, to present what is, what is the tectonic paradigm for the construction of the Grenville province itself, but the Grenville in origin in general. So it would have involved a protracted period of uh, Andean style margin throughout the Mesopotrozoic with some back arc development that would have been, and then the, 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 this Andean would have ceased by the collision of another craton, probably Amazonia at around uh, 1G. In more detail, uh, most authors agree with this model. They are variants, but the the the, the large scale the large scale architecture of that model or evolution is similar. Uh, protracted formation of arcs, of continental arc with subduction underneath Laurentia between 1.8 and 1.3, formation of some a period of formation of back arc basin at around 1.3 1.2. Uh, some accretion of terrains and closing of these bark arc basin uh, during what has been called the Shawinigan origini between around uh, 1170 to 1150. Uh, this is the period as well where anorthosite have been uh, formed. 
and then the collision phase uh, between uh, 1.1 and 950 MA approximately. So this model, uh, I don't think it's compatible with the proxies because you would have continuously built uh, a growing origin with the first an Andean continental arc and then with the collision phase. So, and with the subduction underneath the continent, erode, erosion of, 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 of the continent, uh, studies have shown that a lot, of erode, a lot of material is eroded but is going down with the subduction zone and not much is shed into the ocean. So there was the, the it would not have uh, produced a juvenile proxies that we see, and the elevation is quite high. Um, so I don't think it, it works so much. So one can ask, how can we reconcile uh, the the two opposite views? A single lid tectonics versus a Grenvillian super event. Some have tried. Uh, and recently a model have, has emerged suggesting a, a model very similar to the closing of the Pacific Ocean with a double subduction zone. And I think this model uh, evolved from try to uh, incorporate the Grenvillian paradigm into a model that would explain some of the proxies. And the juvenile magmatism was explained by uh, a hotter backcard basin. But basically, it's this, it's a very similar model that to the, the Grenvillian paradigm. So I think it's good to test this model. Because again, uh, the formation of such a huge mountain belt uh, should have exerted at least, a, at least some of it would have exerted some effect on the, on the proxies recorded. So, my style of investigation of tectonic pro problems is to start by, a, by the youngest phase. So let's go with the Grenvillian erosion. When I started to study the Grenville province in 2011, I was very excited because I was coming from my doctoral and postdoctoral studies conducted in the Canadian Cordillera, where I had been tested models such as channel flow, uh, large hot horogen, uh, gravitational collapse, and uh, orogenic wedge. And all these models have been proposed by Toby Rivers in three landmark paper in 2008, 2009, and 2012. He built a model that is a bit summarized here, where you would have a first phase of long, hot, long duration orogeny. Formation of a plateau channel flow and for a protracted period of time, and this period is called the Otta one between 1090 approximately and 1050. Then there would be a, the, the, the convergence would have been reduced, uh, the origin would have collapsed on itself, uh, reworking thrust censure zone and normal censure zone, forming metamorphic core complex before a renewed convergence would have led to propagation of the deformation front within the Laurentian margin, shown in gray here. And this phase would have been short, cold, and short duration, uh, and it's called the Rigolet phase. So, perfect model to test, because back then there was very few robust geochronological data that had been conducted in the Grenville province and few petrochronological study. And this model, uh, especially the ABT, the Alocton Boundary Trust that separates uh, rocks with Laurentian affinity that you see in gray to rocks without Laurentian affinity that you see in, in, in red and green and, uh, and orange, and uh, so this this boundary would have been the, the, the kind of the, the boundary between these two. So rocks in the immediate foot wall here should record the Ottawa phase deformation and metamorphic event. Uh, the collapse 
this zone would have been reworked into an, an extensional shear zone, a normal sense shear zone in the intermediate period. So this should be seen as well within that area of that shear zone. And then uh, we should be recording the short cold, short duration orogen in uh, the paratoctonous belt, which are rocks with Laurentian affinity. And these rocks should record subsolidus deformation for the most part and a, a, a short uh, orogenic uh, cycle, so short PTT path, pressure temperature time path. So this is the, the Canva when I started to do, to, to, to do research in the Grenville. And as usual, uh, I started, let's look at the youngest orogenic phase, the Rigole. So uh, I designed a research program aimed at choosing the best loca location uh, to study the structure, AB, the ABT structure, the Alacton, Alacton Boundary Trust. So all the squares that you see here are field area where my grad students have worked. So let's look at one place here, south of the Manicouaga Reservoir. Uh, in, in red are dates that were available uh, in the literature whereas in, uh, in purple are new dates that we have obtained. Uh, basically, my, my student Sophie Janin obtained. And uh, what she found is that uh, Laurentian rocks in the Perotoctonus belt was, were pervasively molten. Uh, there was pervasive uh, partial melts. And these melt uh, remain in the crust for at least 20 million years. Uh, and perhaps more than that, we have to conduct more precise geochronological study to confirm this, but at the moment it could have lasted up to 40 million years. Uh, and then if we move to the Alloctonus belt and then gray here, uh, there was a granite of the same age, and this granite led to uh, localized deformation and reworking of the Alloctonus belt that records Ottawan age metamorphism. So a very important uh, deformation in presence of melt for a protracted period of time in the, during the Rigole phase. If we move to the northeast part of the, of the Manicouaga Reservoir, a very similar study uh, story emerged. We obtained a lot of dates. Uh, what you see here, the large majority of dates that are shown there are new. Uh, same story, uh, synth kinematic, leucosome and partial melts in the paratoctonous belt. You see on different quartz here that yield uh, 984. So everything here is around 984. And similar to the what we see in the south, uh, leucogranite, uh, regular age leucogranite, uh, localized deformation in the uh, alloctonous belt as well. So what we see is a major present deformation event during the Regale phase. If we look at the in the western part of the Grenville province, we see exactly the same thing. Uh, this is published in, in Precambrian research by my student that just get, that graduated last year, Chris Lambert. And what you see is a that's a beautiful outcrop uh, along Highway 117 at, at Lac Laurent. Roland that shows uh, melting of the paratoctonous nice and migration of melt uh, that you see here. There's a migration of melt that pounds uh, near near Gabro of the Alloctonus belt and produce diatexite. Uh, we have uh, synth, synth kinematic, uh, leucosome and boudinex. Everything yield. We dated many many uh, rocks and everything yields the regular age. Even rocks in, in Alloctonus belt affinity that are recorded in the core of Zircon, uh, you can find synthectonic granite like this this one around a sheet fold that yielded a, a, a regal age. Uh, again, protracted melt present deformation in the western part of the Grenville province as well. So, uh, in in contrast to, to what had been suggested by Rivers, the Rigole phase is not a short, cold, and short duration orogen, orogen, orogenic phase. It's a long, hot, long duration orogenic phase. And that made me wonder, so what, what, the, what was the driving force for that, uh, for that phase? 
because according to the model, you had a collision, thickening of the crust, collapse of the crust, and then what would have driven the renewal of the convergence to lead to such a major orogenic event? That's not very clear to me. What would be, what could be, a, the, what kind of tectonism could, could drive that? Furthermore, as I said before, um, looking in the foot wall of the ABT, we should record the Otawan phase of the formation, recording the juxtaposition of the alloctonous belt and the paratoctonous belt. Um, we have dated many, many zircon, uh, well imaged, well characterized, uh, conducted laser ablation ICPMS on these, obtained trace elements data as well to, to separate the types with according to morphology, to chemistry. And from 95 grains, from 10 specimens of leucosome and leucogranite, that present evidence of xenopristic cores, none of these grains pre present any sign of OTA1 growth. So we could not confirm uh, this model based on our data. So uh, let's move to the OTA1 phase. How well constrained is the, it's been suggested that the collision occurred at 1.1, but how well that is constrained? Well, I think the best study that for a reason that I can't explain has been largely ignored in literature and recent literature. Uh, this study is excellent because they look at the, the, the collected mafic rocks that present clear evidence for high pressure, high temperature metamorphism with beautiful garnet and clinoparoxene assemblage, uh, good uh, phase equilibria models that produce high pressure uh, conditions, and uh, robust geochronological studies uh, for several samples that all yield the same story, high pressure zircon with flat heavy rare earth element, and they all yield concordant age of 1095, 1090 approximately, so in a collision model, uh, give around 10, 15 million years to bring these rocks to uh, these metamorphic conditions, and you're back to around 1.1. So we know that from 1.1 approximately, the orogen was under major uh, deformation and, and high pressure metamorphism. But what was going on in Laurentia during that time? Well, Laurentia was under extension if, and throughout Laurentia. If you look in the Arctic, you have basins, uh, call them cratonic or, or rift basin. Uh, they are, a lot of them are siliciclastic and they record extension. And the, the dating suggests it's exactly the same age as the uh, high pressure metamorphism recorded in the Grenville province. Closer to the orogenic front, you have the Southwest Large Igneous province, a lot of uh, mafic uh, igneous uh, uh, rocks have been uh, intruded in the, in, the, in the crust, and you have the mid-continental rift, typical two branches at around 120 degrees, lots of volcanics, tens of kilometers of volcanics were, were in place there, implying that the entire crust was, was extended. Uh, rift volcanics uh, were formed. So, okay, I know there are um, rift basin in other collision belt. Uh, it's not that clear that like the Lac Baikal is totally linked with the Emelian origin, but well, it exists. But still, uh, to me, it's a bit peculiar to have uh, a continent under extension that is synchronous with the collision zone. And this was one of the argument put forward by Robert Stern to suggest his single lid episode. Now, there was a, an argument before uh, suggesting that the, the rift formed her before the, the, the collision and was closed by the collision because the date that we had in 93 from Rubidium Stromson age suggested that the faults were active at around uh, uh, one, uh, 10, 1090, so same as the high pressure metamorphism. 
but new, ge new and more, much more robust geochronological study by Ajin et al. 2022 demonstrated that the deformation producing these folds and faults is regulate in age. So that model of closing does not fit anymore. And so we know that the mid-continental rift develops synchronously with the collision, which is to me very peculiar because we're just in the in, in the foreland of the of the thing and the orientation is not really compatible with the with with the compression anyway another peculiarity uh, for the rocks of the rift is that they preserve clear evidence of a marine influence marine structure uh, tidal wave structure a chicken wire structure and there are two papers, uh, one by Jones, another one by Stewart that I didn't put in here, uh, demonstrating that there was marine structure formed in, in the rift. Remember, we're in the middle of a continent, uh, right in the middle of the continent, behind a major collision front. Uh, I guess it's possible that it had access to a sea, but it's not likely. And this, the, the, these uh, structures were confirmed by some geochemistry by Stukin et al. 2020. There's more. Uh, this is the study that inspired my model, the one by Swanson and Isol 2019, in which he dated precisely uh, each volcanic layer in the mid-continental mid rift. Uh, these are unmetamorphosed, undeformed volcanic layers and it, so they are perfect to derive uh, good paleopoles and uh, from that he demonstrated clearly that from 1110 to 1090 to 1080 approximately Laurentia was moving at a blistering pace toward the south and blistering pace in excess of 20 centimeters a year probably closer to 27 this is faster than the convergence of India towards Asia for the formation of the Himalayan belt. So, uh, as argued by uh, Swenson Isol et al., this is not compatible with an upper plate setting and is more compatible with the lower plate setting. However, in that study, they did not mention uh, the, that this, this event is perfectly coincides perfectly with the high pressure metamorphism that is recorded so i would add to that that it's not compatible with a lower plate with an upper plate setting but it's not compatible even less with a collision phase so we have to this is a very major point because if you were in a lower plate setting and there was no collision at that time well, what produced the high pressure metamorphism recorded in rocks? It's not clear. And furthermore, if it's a lower plate, then how it got in the lower plate setting? Because all the model all suggest that we, that before that, we, there was subduction underneath Laurentia and that this is that subduction that brought the Amazonia in collision with Laurentia. So one has to explain uh, something, a collision of an arc or something that would have switched the polarity of the subduction zone. And that brings us to critically evaluate the model of Andean style tectonism. Now I have to, before I go forward, I have to say that Kulsha et al. last year published a new model uh, involving accretion of, uh, of arcs, of terrains, a bit like the Cordilleran style throughout the Mesopotamozoic uh, with some subduction flip that I don't really explain but still uh, uh, this model is much more compatible with the global proxies than the, the, the Indian style but the same problem emerged because at the end they have a subduction underneath Laurentia and this is the only model suggesting this kind of Cordilleran accretion so let's test the, the paradigm of a continental arc construction. This map is important because it's a compilation of all rock units older than 1.8 GA in the entire Grenville province. 
As you can see, these rocks are localized in the paratoctonous belt bounded by the ABT and the Greenville Front. There are not a single uh, rock in the alloctonous belt that records older ages than 1.8. This is a bit peculiar for a continental arc because if we look at the Andes, the archetypal Andean uh, style mountain belt, there are many, many basements cropping out in the Cordillera. Each point that you see here are Grenvillian basement cropping out in the, in the Cordillera. So uh, I would have expected to find a lot more basement exposure in the Alloctonus belt if it was a continental arc. There are none. And this area is well mapped by the Ministère des Ressources Naturelles, which is the Quebec Geological Survey. Furthermore, on that map, I added uh, in the Paratoctonus belt all the intrusions that are younger than 1.7 GA. You can see they are localized here. There are not a single other intrusion younger than 1.7 anywhere else in the Greenville province, in the, the Paratoctonus belt. And the 1.5 to 1.4 GA rocks that are here, uh, they are rocks of that same age with a hard signature that are here in the Alloctonus belt. So this was presented by Kolsha, Slagstad and co-authors as a strong evidence for the, for the building of a continental arc because the, with the subduction underneath Laurentia. However, this is the only place where you find these rocks. Similarly, the orange here plutons have been suggested to mark uh, the back arc basin formation uh, of that continental arc. But look at what is in the superior province. You have the 1.25 GA Sudbury dikes that are concentrated. They are localized where you find those 1.5 GA pluton in the paratoctonous belt of the Greenville province. They are not anywhere else. So I think there are alternative. Uh, so I would have expect to find a lot more uh, igneous rocks in of that age if it was a continental arc built on or with subduction underneath Laurentia. It's not there. The granite here, 1.5, 1.4. Well, I noticed that this is the granite rhyolite province, and this this would this could be the the, the northeastern. Uh, manifestation of this magmatism, which is highly for which the, the tectonic models are highly controversial. So, from geological point of view, uh, there are very few arguments to argue for the continental arc building during the Mesopotrozoic in the Grenville province. If we look at the geochemistry, uh, it's a Peer's diagram. We compile all mafic rocks, filter them according to standards. And you see that uh, in the Grenville province, they plot uh, below the, mostly below the Andean, the, 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 the Andean field that records contamination of mafic rocks with continental uh, rocks and elevate the thorium e tribium ratio. Even more convincingly, uh, this is a map of when there is a color uh, that the, the unit is well dated by uranium lead geochronology on Zircon. The points are rocks that were analyzed by uh, Alan Dickin and co-workers with well-constrained niodymium uh, model H. So a way to attest the juvenility of, of rocks is to compare the difference between these two systems and if they're close together, they are juvenile. And if they're far away together, it means that rocks uh, were uh, incorporated older component. For example, in the Andes, the difference is around 0.8 uh, GA, which reflects a young mountain belt, young igneous activity uh, produced on an old crust. So what this shows here is that rocks in the Grenville province are highly juvenile. Uh, they are actually the same age with an error of the two system. And there's no pattern of younging or holding 
that are that is apparent in the in, in the allotonous belt. So from a geochemical point perspective, there's not much evidence for the bu building of a continental arc neither. Now, uh, we talk a bit about the Granite Rhyolite province, which has recently been linked to the 1.4, 1.5 Pinwarian igneous activity in the Alloctonus belt in the Granville province. Well, um, despite their same age, the expert in such rocks, frost and frost, strongly argue that they cannot be formed in, a, in any type of subduction zone. In any type of Andes back arc, continental arc back arc, uh, these rocks cannot be formed there. So it's highly debatable that the two 1.4 GA igneous rocks are, uh, can be correlated. It might be fortuitous that they are the same age. So now what? If the continental arc phase if there's no evidence for the continental Andean type phase, if the model of collision at 1.9 is heavily criticized, does not fit with a lot of data with the timing, the synchronous timing of, of rift development, continental collision, uh, with the paleopoles move, move, movement of, uh, of Laurentia rapidly toward the south, and if the, the short coal phase is in fact a long hot duration phase uh, during the Rigolet, which is a bit peculiar for required of a, a renewal, a significant renewal of convergence after the origin had, uh, had collapsed on itself. What do we do? Do we have to conclude with Robert Stern that there was no tectonism? Perhaps. But I think there's another plate tectonic solution that better incorporates data. But for this, we have to remove Laurentia from mo mo most of the equation. Let's assume that for most of the Mesoproterozoic, Laurentia was in the northern latitude with a passive margin along that side, which is not recorded in, in the compilation, by the way. And that in an ocean far away from Laurentia, you had the formation of oceanic volcanic arcs. You build these arcs, uh, they shed juvenile material into the ocean. Uh, volcanic arcs does not very, get very thick. They are usually characterized by a high temperature pressure, ra pressure ratio. And then at around during the Shawinigan orogeny, this orogeny could have marked the amalgamation of these arcs to form a microcontinent and they probably am amalgamated as well with some continent, which on Creighton, like Amazonia or Kalahari, because we find detrital zircon, uh, older detrital zircon in basin of the Alloctonus belt. And then imagine that the subduction uh, beneath this, this, this continent stagnated at the, at the mental uh, boundary, a bit like is what is recorded in the, what has been uh, recorded in the Canadian Cordillera, and then that around 1.1, 1 .1, uh, this material was too heavy and pierced the, the boundary, dragging the oceanic the oceanic uh, plate that is attached to Laurentia to the south, closer to Shawinigan. This would have put Laurentia in extension, forming the basins in the Arctic, the mid continental rift and dragging the craton very rapidly towards Shawinigan. Simultaneously, you could have had the slab avalanche could have led to the Ottawan phase of metamorphism, high pressure metamorphism in the uh, Shawinigan uh, continent. And the two continents collided together for the, during the Rigole phase of the Grenville Unorogeny producing a large hot horogen with evidence for protracted melt present deformation. So this model, I think, is much more compatible with a larger data set than the previous ones. We tried to look at geochemistry to see if it was if there was some support on that. This is a granite uh, discrimination diagram and we subdivided the rocks into three periods. The one that would precedes the slab avalanche process 
the one synchronous with the slab avalanche process and one uh, after the collision, the proposed collision. And what we can see is that there's a trend from hard type before the slab avalanche to hay type after the slab avalanche, which is after the collision, which is compatible with the model. Similar story for mafic rocks. Uh, we can see that the the rocks before the slab avalanche pro, pro, uh, process plot in the subduction field that you can see here in yellow. Then they move into the Andean signature field that you see in, in, gray, in, in red here. This is where you have a really an Andean phase. This is the only phase where you have Andean type uh, tectonics and you, it records contamination of mafic rocks by the crust of the Shawiniga. And then as the slab uh, is cut by the collision, uh, material, uh, material input is more important. So the, 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 the rocks migrate towards the mental area. So I think the geochemistry support the model. What about proxies? Well, for most of the Mesoproterozoic, you would have had uh, you would have had volcanic arcs, non-radiogenic rocks shed into the ocean, forming detrital zircon that are highly juvenile, and uh, limestone that records this juvenility. And you did not did not have much continental collision back then. So this is why uh, you don't counterbalance the strontium isotope ratio. And this type of model does not produce thick crust as the previous model. And if we believe that the, the Europium anomaly story, that would explain this, uh, this trend. And as well, uh, in a hotter mantle, uh, in a hotter hearth, uh, the, the, the geothermal gradient would have been very hot forming a hot, high, hot metamorphic rocks. So this model is also much more compatible with the proxies for tectonic activities. So that's it. Uh, obviously, I want to thank all my grad students who put their heart into field work. Uh, my partner with the Ministry, Ministère des Ressources Naturelles du Québec, the Quebec Geological Survey, especially my colleague Ali Muxil, is, is invalu invaluable for that story, for that for for these studies, and uh, a lot of that deep, a lot of that uh, most of the conclusions depend on depend on the on, on robust geochronology that have been provided by my colleague Kyle Larson and Jim Crawley. On that, I thank you for your attention and I happy to welcome any questions you could have. I, hopefully those who want to ask questions could as well. Um, so we're gonna go ahead and transition to that question and discussion session. Um, you can raise your hand with the raise hand if you click reactions at the bottom. Uh, the raise hand button is there. Uh, or you can type your question into the chat and uh, I can ask it. Um, so, go with that. Do you have any questions for Felix? I can't believe there's no questions. And I'm wondering if there's, if there's someone like the follow at the end. You ready, Andre? Yeah. So maybe I ask a simple question. Uh, so do you have uh, any preservation of uh, passive margin deposits on Laurentia site? Um, Um, it's a good question. There is a uh, abundant uh, banded iron formation at 1.8 around 1.8, 1.85. And these are found uh, almost everywhere along the length of the Southeast margin of Florentia. Um, but that's a good point. Apart from that, we, but 
very few studies have looked at these sediments. So uh, maybe they are all the sediments that we've seen. Uh, I don't know. Well, this is part of a previous cycle because uh, it, it was uh, closed uh, during Trans Hudson erosion, but uh, leading sort of at 1.3 or 1.5, like there is something in, I think in uh, New Jersey with maybe 1.3, um, uh, but it's like Belmont, uh, Belmont mine. But it's barite where, but I don't know if you would put it on a arc site or it would be part of a uh, part of a Laurentian in your model. Um, I was reading the chat. People were are muted. Uh, yeah. Somebody uh, asked uh, that I repeat the point about the granite. Yeah, uh, Paul. Did you did you have a question there? You should be muted now, Paul. Mm -hmm. But uh, the, I missed the, the last point uh, you, you were uh, mentioning. Uh, and oh, the... uh, I was saying with uh, where, where information that you mentioned 1.8, yes. uh, it's part of a previous cycle. So it was closed with uh, Pinocchian or Trans-Hudson Aerogenia, but uh, I'm more interested in passive margin uh, sort of at the time when your arc were accreted so around that, I guess one that's point definitively three. a test of the model that's definitively a test of them thanks for bringing that up and uh, I, I know in New Jersey there is a, a success, highly metamorphosed successions with uh, zinc mineralization with barite it's like, uh, for example, in Belmont mine. Uh, yes. And I think uh, this succession also continue in Quebec. Um, uh, yes, there's uh, a lot of evaporite yeah. and uh, the, the mining companies have even found uh, anhydrides. Yeah. Uh, but it's in the Alloctonus belt. Okay, so it would be part of the arc with accreted. Okay. Yes. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay. Um, uh, uh, maybe... Like John oh, wanted you to repeat the 1.4 to 1.5 granite rhyolite province point, just so that maybe we start there in case other people missed that as well. Um, do you need to share your screen again? It seems like your audio is better without it. Because I'm not speaking. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. So I think it's this here. Asked about the point about the approximately 1.4 to 1.5 billion year old granite rhyolite levels. Yes. So uh, <clears throat> the only place we see these 1.5 to 1.4 GA granite in the Paradoctonus belt are here in the southwestern most exposure of the Grenville province near the, the Great Lakes. And this is really the northeastern exposure of the granite rhyolite province that you see on the right here. So uh, I think that the granite that are here are perhaps the, the extent of the, of the province, the, the, the granite that you see in the, I mean, the, the granite that you see in the Paratoctonus belt and the superior province. All right, Paul. Did you have a question? Uh, no. Um, okay. I like I like the lower plate model for the uh, Grenville of Laurentia, and I think the argument about the rifting being incompatible with collision is silly. I mean, uh, all the seismicity in Tibet today is normal fault dominated, east-west stretching, and uh, rifting in the Rhine Graben is uh, in Europe is uh, coincident exactly with collision in the Alps. Um, in the in Tibet, uh, you're in the. Do you mean very very far away from 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 Tibet, in the north? Because in in Tibet itself, you're you're looking at the plateau, which is which is under extension because it's a plateau. And 
uh, in the Himalaya, you also have the the influence of the subduction underneath Asia to the east. So I'm not sure it's all due to to compression. Sure, but the uh, but this manifest and tapping yeah. the tapping the entire crust to the mantle. Uh, well, no, the seismicity is in the upper crust, and it's yeah. indicating normal faulting. Contemporaneous with the uh, you with with plate ongoing plate convergence, so there's no incompatibility with with uh, rifting, say in in uh, in, in Laurentia and 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 collisional orogeny. Um, well, I'm not sure that the shape of that rift. There's the another shape of the rift is degrees arms in the mid continental rift, so it's not like if it's a it's a rift perpendicular to compression. Um, I'm maybe, but I'm to me it's a uh, maybe you're right, but the the I think that the model for mid continental rift is really a, a rift developing in the like any other rift with one twenty degree arms. Um, well, the rift has also been compressed because it's a syncline. Yes, but the compression occurred much, much later. It, About it's 100 not... years later. <clears throat> so okay. let's say that this is debatable. Okay. Um, we have a hand up. I think Kay Lawson. I don't know how to, what your name is, but go ahead. Yes, uh, Klausen. Yeah, Martin Klausen, Klausen. from uh, Stellenbosch in South Africa. Can you hear me? Yes, I'm ready. Go ahead. Okay, Excuse cool. Me. Yeah, uh, thank you for your talk yeah, and uh, an interesting new model interpretation. I I'm still kind of uh, viewing the these uh, Grenvillian and uh, this Mesoproterozoic uh, many places as back arc rifts, continental rifts. But I'm I'm more curious about what about the anorthosites, mangorites, chonakites, granite complexes that sort of are a lot older and are, are located in the Grenvillian. Are they sort of formed somewhere else or uh, do I misunderstand this? Because it seems like there's been like a periodic magmatic activity along the Grenvillian throughout this transition from the Nuna to the Rodinia. Uh, and that's why yes. I kind of favor this back arc rift, if you understand. Yes. All the uh, anorthosite are in the alloctonous belt first. They are not in the paratoctonous belt. And okay. from what I understand, the various model for the formation of an orthozite uh, requires melting of uh, eclogitized arc, uh, arc basal crust, the, the basal part of the of the crust uh, of okay. arc signature. So this I think does that nicely with the with, with with the model. There's no problem with that. Uh, interestingly, uh, uh, Jean Bedard's talk uh, in that uh, in, in this uh, series in 2021, I was really interested because he suggested that when he was melting a, a, an Archean uh, oceanic basalt, he was producing exactly the same uh, pattern, the, the, the same geochemical pattern of an that he was seeing in anorthosite. And I think it's this is very interesting. Uh, if you think about the, if we're going back to, it's already there. Maybe that uh, there was one of these old uh, oceanic basalt uh, between the, the 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 arcs that I'm proposing in the in here and the cratons like Amazonia or Kalahari. And that the melting of these produce uh, the massive anorthosite uh, because a lot of them were produced right after the Shawinigan orogeny at around 1150. Most of them were there. There are others, but most of them were produced uh, at that time. And I think this is this is if if this is the the correct model, ancient Archean uh, oceanic basalt. Uh, it doesn't. It's not compatible with the continental arc. Uh, model because I'm subducting new, uh, old, very old cross there. So I think it's compatible. Okay, fine. I'll have to think about it more. And I don't really understand the Grenvillian well enough, I realize. Thank you. 
You're welcome. Okay, so at the moment, there aren't any hands up or more comments. Let's give it a second. All right. Well, thanks, Felix. Good talk and some good discussion at the end. Unfortunately, the audio wasn't the best, but I I'm think... so sorry about that in front of everybody. Sorry about it. No, I think it's okay. Uh, oh, there are two ends raised. Well, thousands is still up, I think, huh? Uh, and Paul, did you want to speak up again? Well, I, 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 am I on? Yeah, yeah, you're on. We can hear you. You can go ahead. Yeah, I think the challenge of the Grenville looking forward is is to um, uh, place it in the uh, in the global context because. Uh, Orogenic belts of, of uh, uh, Grenvillian age are worldwide. I mean, they occur in practically every uh, craton, uh, with the exception of West Africa. Uh, for example, the Namakwa Natal in uh, in Kibaran in Africa, the Rondonia Sunsus in South America, um, also in uh, South Australia, um, and and so I think that uh, the goal, and maybe this should be a you know, I, you know, a, 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 an international project will be to make kinematic sense of the um, of the of the greater Grenville origin from a global perspective. Yep, it's interesting. I've started to collaborate a bit with Charlotte Muller in uh, in Sweden, and uh, after visiting uh, southern Sweden. Uh, I, I was, I, it, it's the same thing. It's exactly the same thing uh, there that I, I'm seeing in, in Quebec. So that's a start. Uh, but that's a that's a good point. If, if some people are interested, uh, drop me a line. I'm I'm on. And All actually, right. if somebody has a question, just send me an, an email. I'm really really happy to to respond by email or even. <laughs> yeah. confuse you with a zoom meeting <laughs> yeah i think uh you you included your email with, with what you sent me to send out to everybody so yeah email felix if you want to thanks felix and thanks thank you everybody. very much for the invite mm -hmm. um looking forward to seeing you all next time uh so take care um and see you later Bye.